On today's Locked on Jayhawks, maybe the most disappointing loss of the Lance Leipold era. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Derek Johnson? You can find me on Twitter at DJohnson Radio, and that was a doozy. Kansas falls to UNLV 23 to 20, the final score, arguably the most disappointing loss of the Lance Leipold era because it was compounded with last week. We're going to get into that, what happened in the game, more struggles for Jalen Daniels and Jeff Grimes. Uh, still some good stuff from the defense, and we'll get into some of that. Go to the game. What's next for KU? I know a lot of KU fans are saying basketball is what's next. So, um, We'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know, very unfortunate. Anyway, uh, today's episode of the show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase with Game Time. So Kansas loses twenty three to twenty. They drop to one and two on the season. Very similar game to Illinois. To be completely honest, it was a game where the defense overall played well but couldn't make the key stop at the end. But still, the defense played more than good enough for you to win this football game. Um, you also look from a standpoint of, well, what did KU do uh, running the football? They averaged 5.7 yards per carry. Now, that number dipped pretty heavily in the second half because they started loading the box and were just saying, hey, we don't believe you can beat us downfield. We don't believe you can beat us in the intermediate throwing the football. And they were right because Kansas couldn't do that. Uh, but similar in the way that, like, I look at this game, and I and this is what honestly makes it more frustrating. I'm like, oh, Kansas defense, this might be the best defense of Lance Leipold era. I look at the running game. I'm like, well, the running game, you're still running the football. You average 5.7 yards per carry. You get 199 net rushing yards in this game. I still look at it and go, special teams played a good game. You had a no, nice couple open field tackles on, on their return game. Tabor Allen took care of business and hit his field goals, hit his PATs. Um, you know, you're looking at this and you're like, oh, why did you lose this game? And for back-to-back -back weeks, just like the Illinois game, it comes down to two things. It comes down to some really bad interceptions thrown by Jalen Daniels and the inability of the passing game to get going and the predictability of Jeff Grimes' offense. I mean, there were at least five receiver screens, and I don't know that any of them really worked. Even the ones that gained like six or seven yards, it took like Luke Grimm or LJ Arnold like breaking a tackle like a yard past or at the line of scrimmage just to make that happen. It almost led to another pick six coming at you. Uh, you couldn't run the ball in the second half because of the inability of Jalen Daniels to throw the football. And you look at this, this is arguably the most disappointing loss in the Lance Leipold era. Like, I, again, we could go back and, and talk about the list. The, the loss at K-State last year certainly disappointing from the standpoint of you had him, you had the shot at the king and you missed. But still, it was understandable to lose that game to a good opponent with a third-string quarterback. This is not understandable, and that's why this one almost becomes more frustrating. And then it gets added on that it was the same way last week. And so you do it back-to-back -back weeks. I, I said this on Twitter. It felt like you were you were watching David Beatty football again. Obviously, the team is in a much better situation program-wise than they were with David Beatty. Lance Leipold, way better coach than David Beatty. The team is more talented than they were. All that stuff. Like, they're going to win more games than, at least I hope, than the David Beatty seasons where you maxed out at three, right? I, I still think this team can contend to make a bowl game. But that's the key fulcrum there you no longer are at a point where you're saying, oh, can this team win eight or nine games? Can they win 10 games? Can they compete for a big 12 title? It now becomes, can you even get back to six wins? Because to even get to that point, you got to go five and four in big 12 play, which that's not a guarantee because you lost games to UNLV and Illinois who are going to be worse than a lot of the opponents you play in big 12 action. Now the season does restart after this week in a certain standpoint. Maybe this team needs that. They need to see the zero and zero record in big 12 play and just focus on that. And that's great if they can do that, but it's very hard because now the confidence is shaken. Now the fan base confidence is shaken. What's your home field environment going to be like for the games at Arrowhead? 70,000 strong. I don't know. What if they only get 30,000 in there for the first game, right? I mean, it's going to look way more empty than it would because you're playing in that cavernous uh, stadium, right? Like, that's going to be a bad thing. And I hope that doesn't happen. Like, I, I know I mentioned that at the beginning. Like, a lot of fans are like, okay, on to KU basketball, on to late night in the fog. We're probably going to end up doing more KU basketball content here over the next couple of weeks because that's probably what you're going to tune into. It's unfortunate for me, though. I love football. I'm still going to be paying attention. I'm still going to be, you know, going to the games and, and doing this stuff with the games. So, but, you know, I'm serving a broader audience here. And that is unfortunately what is probably going to happen here. 
it's just uh, it, it's disappointing, and I think it is a huge crossroads. I mean, so I, I actually go back. I, I think there are some similarities. If you look back at that Iowa State team, the Iowa State team that lost to Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship game in, I want to say, 2020, they brought back like all their starters to that next team in 2021, and I think they only went like six, won six or seven games. I don't know if it was just guys maxing out their ceiling, weird stuff happening in the next year, injuries, whatever it is. I'm wondering if that's kind of what this season is for KU. Now, the good news is you still have some good young players that are growing that I think the the bigger outcome ceiling season would be when this recruiting class that they just brought in becomes older players. But obviously in today's day and age of college football, not to get too dark on this, but you never know like what players are going to transfer. Heck, with KU's one and two start, you lose at West Virginia in week four, start one and three. Do any KU players say, you know what, screw this. I'm opting out. I'm taking my red shirt like we saw with Khalil Herbert and I'm leaving to go to another school and preserving another year. I don't know. That's doomsday scenario. I probably shouldn't even get into that, but like this is where your mind starts wondering when you see this stuff happening. And again, like I I felt like the last two weeks, Kansas has been the better football team. I did not come out of this game thinking UNLV is like, I think Boise state is a way better team than UNLV is from watching some of those things. Like that last drive that UNLV scored, it took so many weird things happening and the fluke stuff happening. Like, again, a weird rule going against Kansas in the same way that the Illinois muffed the punt that went into the end zone that wasn't a safety because of a weird rule. Same weird rule on this, that they get the first down on the fourth and, and short where you kind of get screwed over of like, okay, if they blow the whistle earlier, he's short of the first down. But because they let him keep going, he ends up fumbling, but they blow it before the fumble. And it's just like, what's going on? But you would think that would have been a first down and then the 15-yard penalty. Now they're first and goal at the 16. And because they get that one extra play or two extra plays, whatever it was, they end up scoring the touchdown. Maybe if they don't, they don't score a touchdown, but that's in the rule book. So weird rules going against you, fluky stuff, the fumble thing, like, yes, fall on it. But like three, I, I think there were what, four attempts by Kansas? to grab that fumble i think three of them were people jumping on it trying to fall on it so yes there was the one scoop that was problematic um but like there still were other chances so there's weird stuff happening there's you not playing well there's you not making the clutch plays there's the opponent making clutch plays but it's also these last two games i have not been that impressed with illinois and unlv i have just been more depressed with what kansas has been and so that can go two ways right we can again play the optimistic game and say well if kansas just stops you know shooting themselves in the foot They'd be 3-0 and right now, and they'd be in an okay situation. But the problem is we're seeing it over and over again. Nine penalties for 90 yards, interceptions that are bad, unable to make big plays. Like I mean, Kansas held UNLV to 2 of 13 on third down in this game. Uh, Kansas had the big lead early, but again, you screw things up at the end of the first half, have a huge – I mean, that that's a 10-point swing, that interception you end up throwing at the end of the first half. Just so many things that make you want to pull your hair out, and – I don't like playing the blame game. I don't like pointing fingers to one or two guys because typically it is more than that. It is typically not just one or two guys who decide things. But when I see Devin Neal running the football 23 times for 120 yards, when I see, you know, the Lawrence or the, the KU receivers making a couple nice catches in this game, when I see Tabor Allen, your young kicker, showing up well in this game, when I see the defense holding UNLV to 23 points, which really would have been less than that if you know, maybe a call goes your way here or there, or if you don't throw that interception at the first half, like, and also against an offense who's really good. When I see some of this stuff happening, I'm like, how did you lose these games? But the the one thing where it's like, that did not play well, again, Jalen Daniels, he's 12 of 24. These, the last two weeks, you have five interceptions from Jalen Daniels. You have basically 300 passing yards, and you have this week a 50% completion rate. Like, I don't know what has happened there. It, it blows my mind. He was... He was so good in 2022 and 2023. Was it all Andy Kotelnicki? Is that what we're coming down to? Was it all Andy Kotelnicki? And now that you didn't just go from Andy Kotelnicki to a normal coordinator, it seems like you went to a bad coordinate, offensive coordinator. Was that enough to completely thwart things? Is it that he's just still rusty? Is it the time off that he's not the same guy? I, I don't have the answer here. And it's an impossible answer for what KU should do with him. To be clear, I think they're going to stick with him. And they're going to stick with Jeff Grimes. If you're asking me to predict, because here's why. You look back at some years. I mean, I, I remember looking back at a year of Buffalo where Lance Leipold had a quarterback who had like 16 touchdowns to 15 interceptions. Stuck with him like through the whole year. This is not a staff that makes rash changes. They're not going to make rash changes. So if I'm predicting what's going to happen, that's the answer. But here's what I'd imagine is going through the coaching staff's mind. They see what's happening right now. They see Jalen's not been the same guy. But with Jalen, they talked about him pressing. If you bench him now, 
his confidence is shot for the rest of the season. And some of you might be sitting there going, okay, well, whatever. Let's go with the backup anyway. He's going to give us a better chance to win. Totally fair. But you've seen what Jalen Daniels can be in 2022 and 2023. And if this is just shaking off the rust, the ceiling of what Jalen Daniels can be represents the highest ceiling of KU to get to. So it's almost like the long game of saying, okay, but if we're going for the highest ceiling, we have to get this guy right. And the only way we get him right is by playing him and not benching him because that shoots his confidence. At the same point in time, you saw it in the third quarter and in that second half. KU basically had no faith, no confidence in Jalen Daniels to throw the ball. You run the ball basically on these third and longs on back-to-back plays, on draw plays that get you like no yardage. You're not throwing the football downfield. They had zero confidence in him because they were worried that he was going to throw another interception. And they were basically saying, hey, our defense is playing well. Let's just try to sit on the lead at that point. They had zero confidence in him. So at some point you have to say, well, if we have zero confidence, we can't run our offense. We have to go to somebody else. We have to go to Cole Ballard. We have to go to Isaiah Marshall and give them a try. But then again, once you rip that Band-Aid off, there's no going back. If you decide we're benching Jalen Daniels for one of these guys, you have to be ready to basically say, we ain't going back to Jalen Daniels. You can't play the the quarterback in and out game. You have to be willing to say, okay, we pulled you. Your confidence is shot. We're fully in on Cole Ballard or Isaiah Marshall. And so that's why I don't think it's going to happen. And again, there still is a big part of me inside that's like, Jalen's going to figure this out. Of course he is. We've seen such a big sample size. The longer it goes on and the more it doesn't happen, and now it's back-to-back weeks, and you have questions about the offensive coordinator and scheming stuff up, it it just becomes both scary in terms of what this means in terms of now it's back-to-back frustrating losses, and also that you start having a tougher time figuring out where the wins are going to come on the schedule. They're going to get more wins. I feel good about that, but how many? Are we talking they win three games this year, four games this year, five? Can you get to a bowl game? Right. Can you still salvage a six and six season and make a third straight bowl game, which still would, you know, program wise, obviously from where we were in the offseason, that would be a disappointment. But big picture, if you would have said when they hired Lance Leipold that by year two, they were going to start a three straight year bowl stretch, you would have taken that. So that's kind of what you're shooting for now. And it is a disappointment from the offseason, but that's kind of what this game represented. Even though it doesn't count to the Big 12 standings, if you lost both these games, you ain't competing in the Big 12. Your best chance is trying to make it back to a bowl game and just celebrating that way and building on the season to try to reset for next year. All right, let's continue on. Go to the game. This is Locked on Jayhawks. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for small businesses, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. They help you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to a perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. And uh, I I know I have LinkedIn. It's easy to see jobs that are posted and you get updates. So probably going to get a lot of applicants for your job, which is good. So post a job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college. Post a job for free. Terms and conditions apply. This episode of Locked on Jayhawks is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts, your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, continue on Locked on Jayhawks, and thank you for joining us today, and hopefully this is a positive venting session for everyone. I will say, if you can beat West Virginia next week, you win in Morgantown, people are going to feel a lot better like, oh, it's a reset, especially if Jalen looks good in it. If you win the game like 7-3, to you're going to feel better in general because you won, but you probably won't feel better like big picture about where the team is going. Um, But You know, that's the opportunity you have. On the flip side, you're going to be, I would assume, underdogs at this point. You lose that game and you're one and three. I am very worried about that attendance, as I said earlier, for that home game against TCU and Arrowhead. 
and then things can very much snowball in a hurry from there. So uh, things can get out of hand in a hurry for KU, and I'm going to stick through it and just hope that things turn around, but I don't know that they've shown you a lot right now to give you a lot of faith that that is going to be the way things go, but we will see. So um, you look at the goats of the game here. You look at the good. Let's start there. Tommy Dunn was excellent tonight. Six tackles for Tommy Dunn. He had one and a half TFLs. He had a half sack. He was plugging up runs. He was getting pressure. We talked about one of our keys to the game. Thank you for an every day or listen, um, getting interior pressure. And I thought they did a good job of that in this game. And Tommy Dunn had himself a nice game. Uh, Jeremy Robinson gets a good goat. I know Robinson probably is going to want that one playback where Sluka runs on the third and goal and they almost had him sacked or at the line of scrimmage and he ends up getting to the one to allow him to, to convert the fourth and goal at the one yard line. Uh, but overall, Robinson had a great game, five tackles, three and a half tackles for loss, a sack and a half, two QB hits. Robinson was awesome. Dunn was awesome on that defensive line. I thought J.B. Brown and Cornell Wheeler both played good games. I'll single them both out. But specifically, I thought J.B. Brown was one of the best players on the field. Eight tackles, one and a half TFLs. Mentioned him as as the defensive hawk to soar because we thought with the quarterback running, he'd be able to plug it up a little bit. And he did an excellent job at that, especially on a couple key third down plays um, that I thought he had a good game. I thought – uh. You know, really overall, KU did well on the the line of scrimmage once again, which back-to-back weeks where you did well on the line of scrimmage and you lost the game. And that's uh, certainly frustrating for KU. I mean, you look at it, KU had nine TFLs. UNOV had eight of them in the game. KU had five QB hurries. UNOV had three. Both teams had two sacks. But it felt like, you know, I don't know, KU won at the line of scrimmage in this game. And, and those guys are kind of uh, big reasons why. Um I, I think there's probably a couple others that you could you could point out. I'll be interested to see where like the PFF grade comes out. But like Dylan Woodkey had that nice play. Um, I thought Melo Dotson probably had a good game because uh, it didn't seem like he gave up much in coverage and also apparently had six tackles in a TFL. Um, so I, I thought he was really good for KU in this game. But yeah, those ones really stick out on the defensive end. Tabor Allen, right? You go two of two, you hit a 41-yarder. He stepped up for KU in a real way um, from that standpoint. Devin Neal gets a good go. 23 carries, 120 yards, long of 24, over five yards per carry. He also had a catch for 33, so total up 24 touches for 153 yards. Devin Neal, once again, remains awesome for KU. I thought LJ Arnold had a good game. Four catches for 58 yards. He uh, made a screen pass that probably should have been a zero yard gain into like a first down early in the game for KU on that first touchdown drive. So I thought he played well. Um, I guess uh, Jared Casey had a couple big blocks. I thought Cardell, I thought they got more tight end production in this game, three catches, 38 yards and some big blocks in this game than they'd gotten in some of the past games. But as far as the, uh, bad goats here, um, end of the first halves. I mean, this is back to back weeks that you basically, this time it wasn't a pick six, like it was against Illinois, but for all intents and purposes, it served the same way. You gave up a pick with a long return that eventually led to a touchdown at the end of the half. Almost felt like UNLV was going to screw that up at the end of the half and that you were going to come out of it with unscathed. Uh, but that ended up changing the game in a real way. Even if you just don't score at the end of the half, it's 17 to six, right? Uh, but because you throw the interception, now they're able to get a touchdown and it completely changes the momentum of the game. It changes the score of the game. I mean, you lose by three points. You would have liked to you know, had one extra touchdown off the board or maybe even had another field goal on the board yourself had just scored there. So at the end of the first half's becoming problems now for KU that you're basically, you know, 17-point swing over last week and this week combined when you factor in giving up touchdowns both times and not getting the field goal at the end of this one. And those are two losses where you lost by a combined, what, nine points? 17-point swing at the end of the half? I mean, you'd be 3-0 and right now. Uh, self-inflicted mistakes, bad goat. We talked about it, the nine penalties. And it felt like the second half was just muddled by, KU you can't trust Jalen Daniels, throw down field. Then you get a holding call. So now it's second and 20 or second and 15. And if you can't throw down field, what are you going to do? And you get one on that key play that ends up making it fourth down and 11. So self-inflicted mistakes, the fumble, not falling on the fumble. I would count that as, as a self-inflicted mistake for KU. Um, just little things that kind of add up. Certainly that uh, is the case. And basically 300 penalty yards for KU in two games against UNLV. And then uh, Jalen Daniels and Jeff Grimes get a bad goat. I mean, again, like I want to believe that Jalen's going to figure it out. And I honestly, like, I know a lot of KU fans are mad about it. And I think at one point fans were chanting for Cole Ballard in the stadium and I don't blame them, but 
I almost like it's getting to a point where it's not just like, hey, like just play better. It, it's getting to a point where I'm kind of just feeling bad. Like it just because uh, imagine this. Imagine you were this like high level athlete and you have real production where you have played well. Like you look at 2022, you look at 2023, albeit through the injuries and stuff. But in the games we saw Jalen, he was really good. He was a really good player and he was producing at a high level. That's got to be really hard if you're an athlete and all of a sudden you're playing. And I'd imagine he knows, like he knows he's not playing up to his caliber. He's not playing up to his potential. That's got to be really frustrating. That's got to be really, you know, hard to deal with mentally. Right. And so I hope he can figure it out because I still believe something is in there. Now, do you need to go to Cole Ballard or Isaiah Marshall? I don't know. Maybe you do. Uh, but like I said, that is uh, going to be quite the, because if you, if you, if you open the can of worms, you know, you ain't closing that can, so to speak. It's kind of like Pandora's box. So it's an impossible decision to have. And I think he's a good kid. And I, I am rooting for him to figure it out and turn it around. And that'd be great for KU if they do. But like, it just doesn't look the same. And how much of that is Jeff Grimes? Again, I don't like the fact that you're running five, six screen passes. One of them was also pick six, like receiver screen passes, I should say, um, again in this game because it's becoming predictable. Uh, you run that screen pass on the second and one on the drive that you end up getting a field goal. Touchdown would have been nice there, wouldn't have? Um, yeah, when you could have just ran the ball with Devin Neal. Like, again, <laughs> run the damn ball. I do think for what it's worth, not having High Shaw um, certainly hurts you there because – a, it would have been nice to have a power back in a game like this where it was kind of smash mouth. But also, B, you Devin Neal's never been a guy who gets 30 carries in a game, really. Like, I think there was that one Oklahoma State game that got him bowl eligible where he had, like, 30-something touches. Um, but, like, for the most part, he's a guy who has 20. I mean, they've, they've had games where he has, like, 15. And, and I think 20 is around the number you want to get him to touches per game. And so without High Shaw you're basically stuck in a situation where, well, we're keeping Neil out there, but we want to keep him fresh. So we can't run the ball every play. Cause then he'd have 40 carries and he'd get beat up. We're in the third game of the season. If you had high Shaw, you could have given Neil 20 carries. And instead of having Jalen throw it 24 times, maybe it's 16 throws. And there's, you know, an extra eight carries to high Shaw that are productive plays too, because he's a good running back. And so I definitely think you missed him in this game, but yeah, anyway, um, haven't loved the play calling so far this season. Haven't felt like it's schemed KU open players downfield and I think it's a combination of Jalen Daniels struggling with that and I, I don't know where exactly like you know in this like how much is more to blame than the other but as we said earlier KU's run game check mark it was good KU's defense check mark it was good you didn't force the turnovers defense because you couldn't you know jump on the ball but um special teams was fine it's just the one thing couldn't pass the ball again. And he had turnovers again. If you, I don't even want to ask this question, but I already started. So here we go. If you have Peyton Bender, these last two games, does KU win both games? Probably not getting really any attempts downfield, but probably maybe one less. In, I don't know. Maybe that's a bad comparison. Whatever. All right, let's finish up. What's next for KU. This is locked on Jayhawks. Episode is brought to you by Factor Meals. Fuel up with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Make today the day you kickstart a new healthy routine. What are you waiting for? 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week. You'll always have a new flavor to explore. The Santa Fe Green Chili Beef Skillet, delicious. You can get that and plenty others. Head to factormeals.com slash college 50 That's 5-0. And use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code locked on college five zero at factormeals.com slash locked on college five zero to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active with factor meals. Finishing things up on this episode of locked on Jayhawks. What is next for KU? Like I said, for some fans, they're going to turn their attention away and start focusing on basketball season. Uh, I will continue to fight through it all for KU football season, and I hope it turns around, but I'll be there through the thick and thin, and I hope you're a part of it too. But, you know, I'm not going to look down on somebody who that is the case. I've always loved football, and that's my thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there are going to be, you know, for you football heads, more basketball shows because that's going to get more listens over these next couple of weeks, unfortunately. But anyway, um, the game at West Virginia is the next one. 
West Virginia lost to Penn State handily in week one, but 22 points to top 10, maybe even a top five team. That's not too bad. But they were out yarded by over 200. They were, I think, physically dominated in that game. They did bounce back last week, win over Albany. Now they take on a 2 0 Pitt team who had a comeback win over Cincinnati by one. So this week will be a good opportunity to see what West Virginia has. But regardless, this is a long road trip for KU. It's an 11 a.m. game against an East Coast time zone team that will run it down your throat, a team that KU has done well. They've dominated the line of scrimmage. Maybe not dominate, but they've won the line of scrimmage the last two weeks. If there is any quit in you, if there is any give up from what the record is and from because of the results, what have happened, West Virginia will exploit it because they will smash it and run it down your throat with their running game. So this becomes a coin flip game coming into the day. Uh, college football insiders had it projected 30.6 to 30.2 with Kansas a 51% chance of winning. So basically a coin flip game. I'd imagine after today, that number becomes a West Virginia as a favorite. But even then, West Virginia is not going to be favored by more than a touchdown. It might be even like a three-point spread in favor of West Virginia. But this becomes your season at this point. Like seriously, um, I think the talk of KU being a Big 12 title contender, that's out the window. Now, if you go on like a five-game winning streak, we can have that conversation down the road. It just becomes, can you salvage a season? Can you make another bowl game? And if you lose this game, I start having trouble even getting to that point because you're one in three, the confidence is gone. What's the attendance like for the upcoming home games in a big stadium? This is a must win to salvage your season. And that's not a good place to be when you're going on the road against what could end up being, I mean, a team won nine games a season ago, but opportunity still in front of you. It's a new season with the Big 12. We'll see if they can take advantage. That'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. You can find our show anywhere you get your podcast, including on our YouTube page. We'll be back later this week to get more takeaways from the game, a little KU basketball content as well, and then look ahead to the KU West Virginia game. See you then with Locked on Jayhawks.